You don't kill a black knight, you set them free. As they die in a burst of soul and dash, they may not cry out in despair, but in relief. For the black knights have walked Lordran, alone and without purpose, for an age. These faithful knights have been without their god king for over a thousand years. But once, these knights had purpose. Long before they were black, they were silver, and upon their helms were wings. They were the avenging angels of Lord Gwyn, his faithful knights. Chosen from among the best fighters, their might was such that, to this day, debates still rage on whether they were even human. Were they kindred to the lords, with their superior size and strength? Or did they achieve their power through training and the power of souls? Human or lordkin, they still had to compete, as only the best could earn the honour of becoming a silver knight. To prove themselves, they learnt the art of combat at the Silver Knight training grounds, under the watchful eye of Goth, the leader of the Dragon Slayers. After passing the arduous trials and the years of training, a few would be rewarded. They would be honoured by a gift of armour, an armour which showed their faith in Lord Gwyn, whom they would serve for the rest of their days. They would be armed with fine weaponry, built by the Smith Gods, only for the elite of Gwyn's society and they would be given a shield, a shield with a deep canal flowing on its face, as though to show that they were the banks of the river of Gwyn society, maintaining it, guiding it, tasked with keeping it safe from those who would drain it dry. Now they were ready to defend the domain of Gwyn, and all who dared threaten it. And under their protection, the society of Anor Londo flourished undisturbed. But the Silver Knights would not only fight battles against other lords, kings, and minor powers. Soon, a war began to challenge the gods of the era, the ancient dragons. The Silver Knights were given new armaments, bows so huge that the arrows were like spears, sharpened to a point so fine that they could pierce stone dragon scales. Piercing swords were forged, swords sharpened by master smiths that gleamed in the half-light. They could stab through the armour of a grounded dragon with ease. On the battlefield, they were given one more weapon, the greatest gift of their lord. Gwyn held the power of lightning, and he granted it to the Silver Knights. With unwavering faith, they wielded this new miracle, which they launched in volleys that lit the grey sky. This power, perhaps more than any other, felled the mighty dragons of old. And they were no more. And so, the Age of Fire began, but this is only the ancient history of these knights, and their story has just begun. The Silver Knights return to Anor Londo, but knights such as these do not stay idle. Using the bone of an ancient dragon, they created the Iron Golem. This golem would be the final test in the Silver Knights' deadliest training ground, Sen's Fortress, a masterpiece of traps that ended in a fight that even mighty heroes cannot conquer. This is how ruthless the trial to become a Silver Knight was, just the first test in a life of sacrifice. Many tried to join the ranks of the Dragon Slayers, inspired by what they had achieved. Few would succeed. After victory, honour and responsibility were bestowed upon them, and they became an angel of the Lord. With outstretched hands, they received their weapons, ready to defend their god rulers. And so, their numbers stayed strong, despite the losses in the Dragon War. For even in times of peace, the Silver Knights stayed vigilant, an army ever ready to protect the capital. The Silver Knights watched over Gwyn's reign of fire for an age, but peace is a delicate thing, and trouble is always brewing. The flames began to fade, and one cause of the growing shadow was a competitor, humanity, that precious resource. The fuel of Anor Londo and the surrounding lands was being channeled elsewhere. It was being consumed by demons. The demons also consumed humanity, and so a resource war between Isolith and Anor Londo was inevitable. As the fuel of the flame was diverted, the sun faded. Gods began to leave for other lands, until Gwyn took action. The Lord split his Silver Knights in two. Some stayed to guard Princess Guinevere and the remaining deities, continuing their vow of eternal protectors. They were so loyal, they would even stay to guard an illusion, even staying to protect the manor and the ruined cathedral once the entire family had left. The other half of the Silver Knights made ready to follow their lord. Ever faithful, they never question his will. 
they prepared for war. The mighty blacksmiths of Anor Londo, giants, craftsmen, and gods also worked upon new weapons, designed to slay chaos demons. These demons were inhuman enemies, and so it would take inhuman weapons to kill them. The Silver Knights had fought giant beasts before, but this time, it was not piercing scales that mattered. These were demons of flesh and blood, muscle and fire. They did not need to pierce them, they needed to break them. And so, weapons for breaking were made. Swords, the likes of which Lordran had never seen. Great slabs of metal, that took a veteran knight his whole body weight to wield. But these beaten hunks of iron were sharpened to a monstrous edge, a weapon that could match the demon's brutality. The sword, if you could call it a sword, was the smallest of these new weapons, if you could call it small. The halberd could beat back demon spawn while keeping the wielder at a distance from their flame. Then, there was the great sword, and the great axe. Two weapons of such crushing power, that they would strike fear into the hearts of even the largest demons. With these weapons forged, the warriors said goodbye to their beloved capital, and goodbye to their fellow Silver Knights. They would never be silver again. As they marched to Isoleth, the inhabitants of Anor Londo must have looked on as Gwyn's fading sun glistened in their polished armour. They waved farewell to the protective angels, whose wings would soon become horns. In a fading age, would this be the end of Gwyn and his faithful knights? As they descended to Isoleth, down beneath the earth to the boiling lava pits, it must have been like descending to hell. The stench of sulphur and burning flesh could be picked up from a league away. As the knights walked by the human bones left after demon feeds, they had no doubt, these demons deserved to be put to the sword. After a long journey, the two forces faced each other. Lit by the fire of the caverns, the chaos demons and the silver knights charged and met in battle. In a clash between weapon and claw, steel and fire, the fighting was the most brutal there had been for an age. Other than the war against the dragons, it was the greatest war in all of history. Except this time, both sides had blood to spill. Both fought ruthlessly, for without humanity, both cultures would die. While the Silver Knights had custom forged weapons, the demons had more than tooth and claw. Many of them wielded the most masterful fire sorcery the world has ever known. The same firestorms that brought destruction upon the dragons, were brought upon Gwyn's knights. Isolith's old allies now burnt in her flame. Many knights died, burned to death. But many survived, as the armour forged by the god Blacksmith held firm. With Gwyn at their side, they could never lose hope, and they cut down the demons even as their armour warped. In the fires of combat, they began to change. Their beautiful shields were beaten to rough husks, their angel wings melted to jagged horns, and their bright, silver armour was charred, black. The knights became what they fought, monsters. And so, the knights were born anew, as black knights. These new knights would strike fear into all who met them in combat. As if their equipment was alive, it adapted and became more resistant to fire, their weapons caused more damage against their demon enemies. But in one way, the knights never changed. They remained faithful to Lord Gwyn. Despite the Black Knight's armour strengthening, and their unwavering courage, the demons were still undefeated. The demons too had faith and love for their own god. They fought on their home territory, and with nowhere to go, they fought for survival. Even the power of lightning could not help them. Gwyn still loved his firstborn son, who would later inherit the lightning. Was the firstborn son there in the war, fighting alongside his father, using the power of the Lord's lightning? In his room in Anor Londo are paintings of Isoleth. And what of Havel, and Gwyn's favoured captains, Goth, Ornstein, Kieran, and Artorius? Were they on the battlefield? Ultimately, the secrets of the War of Isoleth rest with the Black Knight. The war went on in violent stalemate. After so many lives lost, and no decisive victory, diplomacy with the demons was given a chance. Discussions were opened, the leaders met, and an agreement was reached between the old allies. There was put in place an accord. 
This accord between Anolondo and Isoleth would be respected until the Lie of the Chosen Undead replaced it. Each kingdom would have a right to a share of humanity. Humanity would be funneled to both realms, so that this valuable resource could be consumed by Isleth and Anolondo alike. And the culture of demons respected this accord, until Gwyndolin broke it. Those who defy the pact, those who trespass Quelag's domain, may you feel the depth of our wrath. The war was over, and so Gwyn left Isleth with his surviving knights, but the reality could not be avoided. With the compromise he had made over already limited humanity, the departure of his fellow gods, the dwindling light of his son, the future was going to be a faded world. Gwyn had to take matters into his own hands. Gwyn saw how to preserve his Age of Fire, by sacrificing himself and his faithful knights in the kiln of the first flame. The Black Knights did not question their lord as he divided his own power. They did not question their lord as he split his soul, they did not question their lord as he gave this soul away, giving it to some who would later betray him. The Black Knights always had faith in Gwyn's actions. They would never betray him. Gwyn passed the power of lightning to his son, the God of War. Gwyn would never wield lightning again, and nor would his Black Knights. They kept their demon slaying weapons as their only armament, and so they left Lordran forever following Gwyn to kindle the flame. They had proven their devotion, and so Gwyn told them his plans. He told them they would burn together in a great sacrifice, and like any group with total faith in their leader, they would die for his cause. They stood in formation as they had been trained, their weapons held up proudly, ready for battle, ready to face the end. Gwyn, his hair now grey, his face worn from the trial of ruling for an age, reached down towards the dying flame, and so kindled the heroes of old. The souls of the Black Knights were a mighty power, but Gwyn's soul burnt yet brighter, the remainder of a god soul. The flame burnt to the seal of the kiln, rendering Gwyn's army to ash, an honourable end after a life of service. But some were too strong to burn away. When the flame was kindled, the fire-resistant armour survived, the body within died that day, and yet, like Gwyn himself, some souls were too strong to pass. The faith in their lord could not die, and so as long as Gwyn needed protecting, they would do their duty. The hollow shells of the dead black knights rose up, animated by the will of the knight's souls, and they protect the kiln to this day. They will defend it unto eternity. Even those burnt in the kindling grip firmly to this plane, for the ghosts of the Black Knights walk the interstice. They are no longer of the living, but they crave to do battle against those who seek to overthrow the Lord of Sunlight. In the interstice, we can only half see them, and they cannot see us, but we see their longing to do their duty. This was the fate of the Knights of Gwyn, the most dreaded enemy of Dark Souls, the most haunting figure of the game. But is it truly the end? For some have wandered from the kiln, they wander Lordran, lost, mindless. Or are they still carrying out Gwyn's will, stamping out rebellions, watching over his fading world? The Black Knights are silent in their task. As long as the armor holds and their spirit remains, they live on through the coming ages. Through countless cycles, the knights survive. With time, their number dwindles, slain by those rare few strong enough to match them. Some survive even to the deep future of Dark Souls 3. But since the rekindling, the Black Knights have always had one foot in our world, and one in the next. To defeat them is to release them from their duty, and these silent knights cry out at last. Is it despair at failing in their duty? Or is it euphoric, saying goodbye to this half-life, to join their lord once more? The choice that the Black Knights made is shown clearly even in the intro. Gwyn is not finding his lord's soul here, from software is tricking us. Look at Gwyn's hair, it is grey, but during the war against the dragons, it still has colour. So this means this moment is after the war against the dragons, and when did Gwyn return to the kiln with his knights? You guessed it, the time he linked the fire. 
Interestingly, it would seem From Software has made a mistake in the timeline and design choices of the Silver and Black Knights, and even after all these years later, they have still not sorted it out. In the DesignWorks interview, Hatsuyama says that the Silver Knights turned black when Gwyn kindled the flame, which Miyazaki does not correct. However, in-game, it states very clearly that the Black Knight set was burnt in the fire against the Chaos Demons, and it was there that the equipment gained such remarkable resistance against fire. This has to be one or the other. It can't be both. Of course, the lore is so extensive and complicated, it is very possible that Hatsuyama made a mistake here, and that Miyazaki didn't want to correct in public out of courtesy. The intro of Dark Souls seems to have Gwyn's knights still with wings on their helms, making them still Silver Knights. Yet, this is definitely the kiln, and it is definitely after the war against the dragons, given his age. Which would seem to imply that there were no Black Knights until Gwyn sacrificed himself. But as a final piece of confusion, as the years went by and this lore debate raged, From Software continued to put in the Black Knight item descriptions that they were burnt in the war against the Chaos Demons. The Dark Souls 3 Black Knight Shield states, Long ago, the Black Knights faced the Chaos Demons and were charred black. Their shields became highly resistant to fire. We decided to choose the story that the Knights were burnt in the Demon War, as it's so much cooler that way. But what the community really needs is a public statement live from From Software's offices, giving a final canon answer. When did the Silver Knights become Black Knights? The design choices for the Black Knight's death shows them vanishing to Sol and, perhaps, Ash, even those found in Laudron. But Silver Knights do this too. A lore polish was made for Dark Souls 3, where the Silver Knight corpses remain after death and are physical, but the Black Knights disappear in Sol and Ash. This also pushes the idea that every Black Knight burnt in the kiln. But if the Laudron Knights burnt in the kiln, then why do their locations seem so specific? It could be coincidence, but Black Knights are often found in locations that seem to counter the plot against the gods. In Dark Root, near where a potential Havel is locked up, and a plotter's tunnel. In the Undead Burg, watching over the corpse of a conspirator, and near the bridge that locked up the same potential Havel. There's even one near the Effigy Shield, right where the plotters failed to invade Nito's domain to steal the Rite of Kindling. If the Black Knights are simply wandering after the kindling of the flame, they have a great intuition for what their lord would want. There is some game design history behind this. Miyazaki said in interview, We've been thinking about introducing wandering enemies since Demon Souls, then it was skeletons and grim reapers, but for whatever reason, we've yet to go through with it. The Black Knight's behaviour was changed slightly, but their role never was. Since they were burned by Gwyn's linking the flame, they wander the land. The wandering was scrapped because it was too hard to achieve, so they placed them fixed after their wandering. Though, it does make you think. They're certainly not where you happen to end up, if wandering mindlessly from the kiln. The question of whether the Black Knights choose where to be is still unanswered. The location of the Black Knights in Dark Souls 2 and 3 is another topic. Dark Souls 2 has no actual Black Knights, but we can receive their weapons from the Kobold or Prowler Hound enemy, as these forms of life are native to the limbo that exists between Drang Laic and the outside world, it seems fitting that the Black Knights, who also now exist in the limbo of the Interstice, drop their weapons from these creatures. In Dark Souls 3, the fan favourites returned, and their location was another riddle. They are found in the Road of Sacrifice, the Smouldering Lake, Farren Keep, and at the Untended Graves. What these locations mean, and what the Black Knights are doing there, is an important discussion for they are not found in what is called the Kiln of the First Flame. Interestingly, the Black Knights in Dark Souls 3 are hostile to some enemies, specifically the enemies of the gods they serve, such as the Dark Wraiths. They will ignore other enemies, but attack Dark Wraiths if they see them. We like the discovery of the intro Easter Egg. The Silver Knights can just be seen in frame launching a volley of lightning bolts, but they do not use lightning in-game. Why? They are still very resistant to lightning, just like Gwyn and other lightning users, but like Gwyn, no lightning. We believe this is because the firstborn son inherited it, and since being outcast from Anor Londo, he chose to stop sharing his lightning power with the Anor Londo Silver Knights. A nice bit of history that has mostly been forgotten is that during the release of Dark Souls, some people felt the Black Knight's design was a lot like a design in Demon Souls, 
Miyazaki states he didn't take inspiration from his previous game, saying, I hadn't expected people to say it looked like a character from Demon Souls though, that wasn't intentional at all. We think he is talking about Yurt, the Silent Chief. What do you guys think? Apart from the horns, is it all that similar? Another aspect of design that helped us in this lore interpretation is that Miyazaki hints that the Black Knights are hollow. He says, I wanted their armour to look like something a normal person couldn't wear. Thick, heavy, and almost hollow. I'm really happy with the final result, in fact. This with the fact that there are no corpses, and in the official artwork, smoke leaks from the helmet. We wonder if these knights are not so different from the ghosts we see walking. They just still have the will to animate their old armour that resisted the flame. Speaking of design works, here is the infamous quote that has caused so much trouble. Hatsuyama. The fact is, they used to be silver knights and were transformed when Gwyn linked the flame. I was really happy that players actually noticed. I saw someone saying, this must have happened when they were burned, and I realised they had got it. Miyazaki. It's always great to see things like that. They had almost five years to make a decision, and we are still left with two stories, where only one can be true. A few little tips for the Black Knights for those of you who still play the game. You can kill the first one with a little trickery. If you draw him to these stairs, and you carefully drop down to the ledge, you can then move a little further along so the AI tries to follow you. The Black Knight will fall to the chasm below. It's a good trick for a beginner though you can just avoid him, as it's not important for progress at this stage, and that's probably wise, for no matter how many times you've completed Dark Souls, these guys are always a challenge, especially if you don't parry. The infamous Bowman can also be dealt with safely, if you are patient. If you walk close enough so that he draws his sword, and then you retreat backwards towards the lower pillar, he will fall down as he tries to follow you. For the others, you're on your own always in unpredictable locations, and with totally different weapons and accompanying movesets, fighting them is always an adrenaline rush. We love the design of the knights. The artist who worked on this was Miss Hatsuyama at From Software, who also did the design for the gargoyles. But just as captivating was their story, and their philosophy. What they stand for is unspoken, but you can feel it. The Silver Knight's training ground, Sen's Fortress, has old armour sets rusting and broken, so much time has passed, yet they will still be there to fire Dragon Slayer arrows at an invader, because they made a vow to protect the city. And we love the name and description of the Dark Souls 3 Black Knight Sword skill, Perseverance. It really gives a sense of their character. They possess remarkable willpower and a fierce loyalty for Gwyn, which is at last put into words. Raise sword in the name of the First Lord. All these ages later, they still have faith they persevere. Black Knights even had an enormous meta effect on the game, from speedruns involving their weapon drops, or PvP tactics. The Black Knights are endlessly relevant, with new things always being discovered. From the game's iconic cover art, to the first moment we saw that silhouette in the Undead Burg, the Black Knights were always going to become legend. In the years since, their popularity has only grown, we found first meeting a Black Knight much more impactful than the first bosses. The sense of power they gave off, as well as deep mystery, was classic, understated FromSoft. We knew these lonely knights would be important, but not how, or why. After understanding the lore, we now know they were the Swords of Gwyn, and they made the Lord of Light's dreams reality.